Hi, everyone. Um, super great to be here. So uh, to jump right in, today I'm going to give a talk called Dumb Jungle, Can We Trust the UI? So a little bit about me to give you some context of like why am I going to be talking about this today. So my name is Guy Wiseman. I've been doing browser and client-side JavaScript security for almost a decade now. Um, and I've been doing, I've been touching a lot of different aspects of this field. So I started off at the 8200 cybersecurity unit working on offensive browser JavaScript security. Um, afterwards, I worked for a small startup that focused on extension security. So basically, we were bypassing ad block in order to retrieve ads back into the page. So a lot of extension security there. I worked for Parameter X for a while, which is known for web security. So um, some client side, bot detection, um, supply chain security at runtime, a lot of stuff like these. I also did some bug bounty work. So I managed to breach a couple of uh, well-known services such as uh, web What's up, web, um, sneak, chromium. Um, and I did all that on my uh, spare time. So make sure you don't confuse spare time with the name of a company. I'm literally referring to my own personal time. Um, and I think the point here is that I always been focusing on the client side um, and securing the client side. But it was always from the perspective of the server, right? Because the server usually has all um, all the assets and the secrets that we want to make sure that are safe. So most of my client-side security work was around securing the client in favor of the server. Um, and these days I have a kind of a unique job working for a crypto wallet. So basically it's a browser extension. And in the crypto ecosystem, we really focus on securing the client in sake of the client because you don't really have a server. All the assets belong to the client. Um, so kind of a unique job I'm doing supply chain, JavaScript, and runtime security in the browser as well. And when I think of things that could go wrong in the client side, there are definitely a lot of different types of attacks that you're probably all aware of. So you have good old DOM clobbering, access leaks, uh, CSP bypasses, prototype pollutions. CSS injections, um, cross-site scripting, supply chain attacks that would execute code in the browser. Um, so a lot of different things, and definitely more. But today, I want to focus specifically on cross-site scripting and supply chain attacks, because these two are narratives that give you code execution in the browser on the client side. And I want to focus on code execution, because it's really easy to demonstrate the what what it means to breach an origin of an application from the perspective of code execution. And then we're going to talk about it, the implications of that, which is going to be what we're going to focus on today. So in order to explore that, I kind of want to start off by talking about the evolution of cross-site scripting from my perspective, and then we're going to do the same trick for supply chain attacks. So cross-site scripting so before we understand cross-site scripting, it's important that we talk about the concept of usability. So usability is really the ability to use software or technology or an ecosystem or a programming language. And in the context of the web, it really one major aspect of usability is the ability to provide input by the user, right? So a quick example of that would be in the world of the web, if I provide my personal name, for example, then the application is going to be able to reflect it back to me using HTML so I could be able to interact with it. But if you think about usability from a perspective of security, specifically from a perspective of code execution, then that is how cross-site scripting was introduced, right? Because you could do this simple thing where instead of only providing your personal name, you also provide some content that just fuses in to the HTML that's being uh, presented, presented to the user and becomes executable code. So that is how we think about cross-site scripting. And what I want you to understand here, and this is a really important principle, is how cross-site scripting is kind of like an outside type of attack, and you can see that in the diagram as well. So you have the code 
that the application ships, which back then was something that we completely trusted, right? Because we maintained mo most of the code, and then everything that we shipped from our servers into the browser was an entity that we'd trust, as opposed to things that come from outside of the application that would be um, input that could lead to a cross-site scripting attack. So I guess this diagram kind of makes sense, and it also means that cross-site scripting is really code that we know for a fact shouldn't run within the origin of our application. It's something that we know that comes from outside, and when it's being introduced to the application, we know it shouldn't be there. So in order to face the problem of cross-site scripting, the web security industry had to catch up. And I would controversially claim that the web security industry kind of fixed XSS. Now, I want to make sure that it's clear. I'm not saying that we're not going to see XSS vulnerabilities anymore. We're probably going to see them for a while. But this time, it's no longer going to be because the web doesn't allow you to properly face them. It's going to be because um, builders aren't well adopting it. So I would claim that if you combine proper sanitization of input, uh, you know, by using DOM purify, trusted types, and a lot of other stuff that were introduced to the web, and you combine it with CSP, which is a great mechanism, so you use the well-known directives, script SRC, dynamic, unsafe eval, inline, and you properly use these two, then you can end up in a place where access is no longer a problem. So I would say that web security caught up, it's just the builders of websites didn't. And it's kind of their problem, right? Because it means that we can ship safe web applications in terms of cross-site scripting. It's just a matter of properly adopting what the web allows us to do. Um, one way to prove that is to think of this 2003 uh, security publication by Google where they showed how they used the different APIs that they introduced into the, into the system. Uh, into the web using uh, CSP, trusted types, a lot of other things, and they managed to get to a point where they are now seeing zero XSS vulnerabilities against the web applications that they ship, which is massive. So it means that XSS is definitely something that we can um, handle. It's just a matter of adopting it. So I would say that the red part here could be now considered as green. Now let's do the same trick for supply chain attacks. This is important. Because with supply chain attack, it's a whole different story. And in order to understand that, we need to talk about software composability. So let's do that real quick. So according to ChatGPT, which is spot on in my opinion, software composability is the ability for software components to be easily combined and integrated to create new applications or system, which is very accurate. And I want to make sure that we understand that composability is actually a very important principle because of two main reasons that I would use to demonstrate. So the first is how the development of software is far more attractive within a certain ecosystem depending on its composability features. So think about JavaScript, for example. JavaScript is a highly successful language partially because it's easily composable. You can create software out of JavaScript really easily, and you have this whole ecosystem of the you know, NPM packages and dependencies, which allows you to easily create software. So for software developers, it's very attractive to build in this ecosystem because of how easy it is to create software out of someone else's software. Now, this really applies similarly to the creation of services. So you don't have to think about it just as code. Think of services such as Shopify or Figma, where you can create services out of someone else's services because they have plugin systems that allows you to just take someone else's creation and integrate it into the things that you create. That is also uh, a manifestation of composability. So composability is very important for a successful uh, job, um, technological ecosystem. So if we think about composability from a perspective of the web, so the web was very friendly as an ecosystem for composability pretty much from the start. So back then, in order to compose software out of someone else's software, all you had to do is to maybe include like a script tag or an iframe. So this would allow you to include 
JavaScript content or actual um, documents into your application. And it's super powerful because you could do it all on the client side. So you didn't have to build or create anything yourself. All you need to do is create a static HTML simple document and then kind of like instruct the browser how to compose your software on the client side instead of having to do it yourself. Super powerful in terms of composability. So an example would be, um, so if you remember our diagram from before where we had our code and input, this time there's also the composable component. So here we would use like an actual iframe. Right? So there's iframe coming from maybe a domain called bad.com, which is going to be useful very soon. And it's just being easily embedded into the application, which is great. But if we think about composability from a perspective of security, then the web kind of had it going also pretty much from the start because they composed the same origin policy. So the same origin policy basically allows you to isolate origins from one another. Um, which means that in this example, bad.com is not going to be able to access assets of example.com and vice versa. But so you can see that instead of using red, we're now going to use the color representing the same origin policy. So now it's something that we trust. But I want to make sure that we understand what does access mean. So think of the following example. What you have here is the two websites, example.com and bad.com. And what's interesting here is that you have what I call assets of, an, of a domain. So each one has its own DOM, its own storage capabilities, and its own network capabilities. Now, the DOM, just to make sure that we're clear about what the DOM is, so the DOM uh, stands for a document object model, and it represents the a live representation of the HTML that's being shipped into the browser. And by live and dynamic, I mean that other capabilities such as JavaScript and CSS can manipulate the DOM and change it at runtime within the browser. So you have the DOM, you have storage capabilities, you have network capabilities, and the communication between them is, while existent, is limited. Because the point here is that according to the same origin policy, the DOM of example.com is not going to be able to access the DOM of bad.com. And example.com is not going to be able to perform network requests on behalf of bad.com. And also bad.com is not going to be able to access the storage properties of example.com. So that is, in essence, what the same origin policy comes to solve. So an analogy that I really appreciate is to think of the same origin policy as actual trees. And I think that is great because the DOM is, in fact, a tree structure. So imagine that these two are the DOM. So you have example.com and you have bad.com. And imagine that within bad.com, there's an insect. I don't know if you can see it, but there's like an insect there, right? And this insect is, in fact, representing something that's bad. So it means that the tree of bad.com is, in fact, infected. And naturally, the insect can travel along different parts of the tree or different parts of the DOM, if you will. But according to the same origin policy, while it can travel along the different parts of the tree, it does not mean that it can jump across trees. That is the same origin policy. That's the whole point there. So now let's continue this exercise and talk about composability in the present. So there's a major shift in how we compose software in the web ecosystem because nowadays we mostly use the build time to compose software. That is because the composability features of JavaScript dramatically improved uh, due to a well-known ecosystem called NPM. So NPM basically allows you to uh, consume dependencies and packages and code created by other people really easily into your application. And that's just like a JavaScript thing, but because of JavaScript being the language of the web, it means that composability for the web naturally improved. 
So what changed now in this diagram is that we still have our code, we still have that.com, but there's an entire complex supply chain that is being introduced into the application in addition to these entities. And the problem is that it's really hard to tell good code from bad code when it comes to supply chain attacks. And this is where we're going to compare it to good old XSS. So let's think about composability from the perspective of security one more time. So a few problems. First of all, supply chain attacks differ from XSS attacks dramatically. Because if we think of XSS attacks as kind of like an outside type of an attack, then supply chain attacks are exactly the opposite. They are kind of like an input, uh, inside, sorry, inside type of an attack. So it means that we are at a point where we can't really trust our own code and our own application anymore. So in contrast to before, supply chain attacks are code not only that we don't want it to execute within our origin, it's even worse. We don't even know if we trust it to run within our origin. It might be, like, parts of it might be trustful and parts of it might not. The second component is how it's not only a new problem. Like, it's not that some part of the application is now introduced via a supply chain. Most of the code that we ship to the browser by our, our application is being originated by the supply chain of our application, which becomes like a very big problem. And the worst part, which is what we're going to talk about today, is how the web isn't really ready for this problem. Because I would claim that we have a need for an increase in the resolution in which we isolate entities. So think of how the same origin policy allows you to isolate different origins and different documents. But we need something deeper. We need to be able to isolate entities living within one single origin, such as dependencies, such as script tags, DOM nodes. A lot of entities that live within one single origin now need to be isolated from one another because we can't trust the code that we ship through our own origin. That is the point that I want to make. So... Just to sum up real quick what we had so far. So the same origin policy allows you to isolate origins from one another. That's great. So it means that bad.com cannot access example.com and vice versa. But this also means the opposite. It means that there's zero isolation within one single origin by definition. That is the definition of the same origin policy. It means that anything within bad.com can access anything within bad.com. And it means that anything within example.com, the application that we trust, can access anything else within our application. So the equation that I want you to remember is how the lack of isolation within one single origin combined with a very complex supply chain of code that we can't trust anymore is going to result in a chaos. So that's what we're going to talk about. So before we talk about how this affects the DOM, which is going to be the main talk for today, I want to give you a very quick example of how this affects storage. So here's a real life example. Visit web.telegram.org, the well-known Telegram application, log in, copy your local storage, and then open another tab in which you're not authenticated with, and then take the local storage that you copied and just paste it back into the local storage of that new tab. And when you refresh, you're going to find that you're logged in to the application. You're going to be fully authenticated. Now, in the traditional use case, that makes sense because it belongs to the same origin of the application and therefore we trust any entity to access it. But as we're discussing today, this isn't very relevant anymore, which means that this could be compromised. Because if you can do this manually, it means that JavaScript code running within the Telegram application can do the same thing. So if it can access the storage and steal your credentials and so easily log in on your behalf, it means that 
maybe we should do something about it. This is just like a, an example of the different keys that if you copy, you're going to find out that you're going to be logged in. Now, let's talk about the jungle. So the DOM is kind of like a jungle, and it's very well isolated across domains. Um, but within one single origin, it's kind of a jungle. It's kind of a mess. And it really all comes down to um, encapsulation. So I want to make sure that we understand what encapsulation means. Encapsulation allows you to restrict direct access to some components of an object. Um, and in order to demonstrate encapsulation, I think JavaScript is a very well example for how encapsulation could be done um, correctly. So scopes is an excellent way to encapsulate information safely. So consider the following example. Here you have JavaScript scopes, and you can see here that I created this function that when you invoke it with a certain secret, then it's going to return to you another function that when it's called, uses the secret, the information that you encapsulated within that function. So it's going to make use of it, it's going to store it within that JavaScript scope, but the point is, is that you're not going to be able to access it anymore, and no one else would. So if someone has access to the function, that doesn't mean they're going to have access to the information within the scope. So storing information in JavaScript scopes securely is something that we can definitely do, and that is the essence of encapsulation. But if we think about it from the perspective of the DOM, then the DOM is really terrible for safe encapsulation because there's literally no encapsulation within whatsoever. You can jump around different DOM nodes within an application uh, by definition. There's no DOM node you cannot travel to from one other DOM node in the entire application um, as long as the DOM node is attached to the document. And it gets even worse across iframes. So as long as the iframes share an origin, then you can also travel through DOM nodes of different documents of different iframes than the DOM nodes of the document of the application itself. So why is this a problem? So if we consider one more time the example from before, then we're gonna learn that this time the problem that we have is not how we have example.com and bad.com where the insects live within bad.com. The change here is that the insects live within our application, within example.com, and there's no way for us to confine them to the parts that they infected. That is the essence of what we're talking about today. So, why does encapsulation matter for the DOM? So, two problems that we have with this, um, with this problem, right? So, one thing that can happen is that attackers can read from the DOM at any point. So, one thing they can do, they can wait for the user to insert sensitive information into the, into the DOM, and once it's attached to the DOM, they can steal it from the DOM, because as we said, there's no encapsulation for the DOM, so anyone can access anything about it. So, just like this very quick example, imagine that I ask the user to provide uh, my email address, and, sorry, the, the user's email address, and then if there's an attacker running JavaScript code within my origin, they might not have access to the email when it's being, um, I don't know, fetched from a server or introduced into a JavaScript scope, but the minute it's being introduced to the DOM, anyone has access to it. So with this very simple code, that, code down there, an attacker can just wait for you to introduce the email address into the DOM and just steal it from there. So that is one problem, and you can obviously think of like how this reflects to real life. And the other part of it is how they can also manipulate the DOM. So manipulation of DOM can result in the activity of phishing the user. So you can convince the user to interact with uh, parts of the DOM that the attacker created 
while making them think that it belongs to the website. Um, and this happened in real life. So um, MageCard was a terrible problem, and kind of, I think still is, of a notorious attackers group that managed to breach a lot, like a lot of supply chains of a lot of websites. And they managed to get to a point where where users would introduce their credit information in order to purchase stuff. And instead of providing it to the DOM of the application, attackers waited there and created their own parts of the DOM, convincing the user to, to provide the credit cards against the wrong part of the DOM without being aware of that. That could only happen when you have the wrong um, the wrong kind of access to the DOM. So now for the fun part, I kind of want to give you a real life example. So as I said before, I work for MetaMask. MetaMask is a crypto wallet, which is in fact a browser extension. Um, and it's a self-custodial crypto wallet, which in fact means that there's a private key, which is a precious secret, which is associated with all the assets and information of the user. And that private key is being stored within the crypto wallet, within the extension. There's no server holding that private key for you. Um, so what you need to understand here is that the compromised private key literally means compromised assets. That makes MetaMask obsessed with client-side security. That is one thing that we focus on completely. So... As I said before, XSS is not a problem anymore because we properly use CSP, we properly use trusted types and other stuff, and we managed to get to a point where XSS was never found in our application because the web allows you to address XSS very well. And therefore, the number one concern that we have is composability security risks, such as the supply chain, because that is something that the web is not prepared for. So... That is why MetaMask has its own Lava Mode team and the Lava Mode project, which is a project that focuses on sandboxing and confining JavaScript code into uh, different parts. Um, and we're trying to take the idea of confinement to a lot of different aspects. So you have the Lava Mode project, the Snow project, you have Scuttling, you have Lava Dome, a lot of stuff that we focus on within the application, within the, within the team. And the idea is to be able to enforce isolation between entities living within one single origin, whether it's storage partitions, which is something that we haven't done yet, but whether it's DOM nodes or JavaScript code or dependencies, this is exactly what we're trying to solve. So today I'm going to talk about Lava Dome, which is the one that focuses on encapsulating subtrees of the DOM because we're talking about the DOM today. Um, and forming a proper solution for this problem without the help of the web and merely by virtualizing JavaScript code is a very complicated task. So this is an experimental tool, um, and it mostly focuses on read type of attacks as opposed to write type of attacks because um, Preventing code from drawing to the DOM is a very complicated problem, but preventing JavaScript code from reading parts of the DOM is something that we think we managed to maybe kind of like solve. So allow me to introduce you to a very quick demo. So here you have the MetaMask extension. You can see here that one thing that I can do at any point is ask the application to show me my private key. Um, the reason that's relevant is because as a user, I want to be able to interact with my private key, maybe export it, maybe just like look at it, whatever. It's my private key and the application should allow me to do whatever I want with it. So that is the point of this feature. But the problem is that while that key is safely stored in the storage and being encapsulated in JavaScript scopes properly, the minute it's being attached to the DOM, it became a problem because any JavaScript code that might run within our application that we don't trust, potentially, can just wait for the user to introduce this 
precious secret to the Dom and just steal it from there. You can see that that's perfectly possible. So if, for example, I do, um, I run this command, then you can see that if I look for, for CCE9, then I can find it, right? So I can find the entire key within the DOM and I can access it, I can extract it, and I can steal it as an attacker. So that is definitely a problem because like most web applications wouldn't say that's a problem because they trust their origin. But the whole point of this conversation is to understand that an origin of ours isn't necessarily something that we can trust. So this is what we're trying to solve. Now, on the other hand, I have here the exact same application, but you can see here at the top that I enable LavaDome using a feature flag for the sake of the demo. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing And you can see here that UI-wise, nothing really changed. You can still see it, you can still interact with it, you can still copy it, but something significant changed, and it's the fact that you can no longer pull off the same type of attack. So if you do the same thing, this time, you're not gonna find the key, right? So it's not going to be here anymore. So that means something very interesting. On the one hand, it means that the user can still interact with it, see it, copy it, and it can still be drawn into the DOM. But at the same time, JavaScript code cannot access the, that information, except for the JavaScript that created this part of the DOM. So this is something really powerful. And the project is called LavaDome. So LavaDome is an open source project. So everything I talked about is completely public, you can check it out, you can see the source code, um, and there's a lot of information about the motivation of this project, why we created it, we are also making sure that it's accessible for um, vanilla JavaScript as well as React, and based on demand, we might try to solve it for Angular or like any other technology that you might be interested of. Um, it should be very simple and it's just like a very interesting project in my opinion because it really leverages a lot of different attacks that might be relevant for this. So leaking information from parts in of the web application that shouldn't be leaked is a whole security aspect that people focus on and great hackers manage to show us how complicated this problem is by exposing some vulnerabilities in this project which we are either fixed or working on fixing. Um, but what I love about this project is that it solves a real use case, it actually makes sense, it's doable, and it's challenging, which means it's not a trivial thing to solve. So I'm not gonna talk about the entire um, technological concept behind it, but basically what we're doing is we're leveraging Shadow DOM technology. So Shadow DOM is a well-known technology that allows you to encapsulate um, DOM nodes in terms of CSS. It's not a security feature whatsoever, but in a clause, closed mode, you can in fact make it less visible significantly to the rest of the DOM. Now, it's not bulletproof, but the whole idea behind Lava Dome is to take the gap between what Shadow DOM allows you to do without being fully secure and fill in that gap and make sure that the security properties that are missing for Shadow DOM are fulfilled using this project. So that is the, the idea behind Lava DOM. It's an actual project, it works, and it's really interesting. Um, just like one other thing about Lava Dome is that it has a live demo without any server because we're talking about client-side technology strictly, and you can most certainly go visit this application and just play with it yourself, but you're gonna see that you have some accessible content that you can at any point access, and you also have a secret which is being regenerated every time you uh, refresh the application. Now the idea of this demo is also to allow you to, to try to hack it, so basically you can just open your dev tools in this application and try using JavaScript, CSS, or anything you want 
to try to access this secret. If you manage to do it, it means that there is more work for us to do. But I think that the direction is rather promising. So to get back to the last slide of this talk, I kind of want to sum everything up for you so this makes sense and where I'm coming from with this talk. So these days, web apps are mostly code maintained by other people. And that is really good in terms of composability. That brings us to a place that we want to be at. We want to make, we want to be able to create software out of someone else's software easily. So the ecosystem of JavaScript, of the web, would be uh, attractive to developers. But composability isn't good for security in the current landscape of the web. Because the web doesn't really take this gap into account. Um, it really focuses on isolating origins, which is how the web was designed originally. But there's no isolation within one single origin. Um, and this puts everything within the origin at risk because of how the supply chain is so complicated. So that means storage, network, DOM, and a lot of other assets that can be accessed um, within your origin. So you want to think of a way to maybe encapsulate different parts of an origin. So imagine that you that we had kind of like a, the same origin policy, but for DOM subtrees. That would be really powerful. That way we could prevent attackers from accessing sensitive information, so we can introduce sensitive information to the DOM without worrying about the rest of the JavaScript application. And we can also do that to prevent uh, parts of the DOM from being manipulated by, by entities we don't trust. But what I like about this, and this is something that I want you to take with you, is how potentially this could unlock new levels of composability for the web. So I want you to think about this. What new technologies could we invent if we could create safely encapsulated DOM components? I mean, imagine we solve this problem then we may be able to create a kind of like an NPM ecosystem for DOM components and like DOM nodes. So you could include DOM nodes within your application that you don't know and don't necessarily trust because you may have a way to safely encapsulate them and safely isolate them from the rest of the application. And that could unlock a lot of interesting use cases. So that's like one thing that I want you to think about and consider. And thanks for listening. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really interesting. And I want to ask if anyone has any questions for Gal. We have a question there. Thank you. Amazing talk. <coughs> Amazing talk. Uh, quick question about uh, Lavadom. Um, in the POC, you showed that it's impossible for JavaScript to read the secret uh, in the DOM. Can you somehow whitelist certain parts of or certain scripts that are able to access this uh, secret? So let's say your feature requires some scripts to read this uh, secret, but other scripts should not be able to access it. Is it possible? Mm, I understand most of it, but I'm not sure I understand the question. <clears throat> so let's say you have this private key and you need, well, your developer, your feature, product, whatever they want to write a script that actually reads this key for a legitimate use case. Mm -hmm. Another script, not the one that created the key, another script in the origin, you still want to pre protect it from third-party scripts, but not from your own scripts. Got it. So, yeah. So... The paradigm that we designed for Lavadome is that as the provider of the secret to Lavadome, it means that you are the entity that should have access to the key in the first place. Now, in order for Lavadome to be like truly secure in terms of the web, the only way to, to, to design it to be actually secure is by not allowing anything to access it, even the creator of, of the Lavadome instance. So if you're the one providing the secret and for some reason you lost it, then your only option is to retrieve it once again from where, wherever 
delete that Lava Dome instance and reintroduce this to the, to the application. But like, you're not going to be able to maybe form a capability that allows you to access the secret and then, and then ship that capability along different entities within the application because that would be probably a recipe for chaos. So really the only way to do it is to, f like from the perspective of Lava Dome, is to, is to not trust you with your own secret. If you provide a secret to the Lava Dome, I'm going to, perf to display it to the DOM for you, but I'm not going to let anyone access it. So if you want to reintroduce it to the DOM, you're going to have to do it yourself. Hi, uh, so thanks again for the talk, interesting talk. I'm myself, I'm a full stack developer. So, um, like from my experience, a lot, of, a lot of the security, like XSS come from the browser itself. Like it helps me as a developer think less about certain uh, security aspect. And uh, what you introduced made me think maybe we can leverage what you started here and take it to the next level. Maybe tell the whoever develops uh, Chrome or Firefox, let's use that paradigm you know, that concept and uh, as part of the browser instead of uh, using an external NPM package. I am so happy you said that uh, because I may have not said that, but that's definitely something that we're working on. So we have great progress in convincing the browser to introduce solutions to that type of a problem. It's just we're not focusing on Lava Dome specifically at the moment, but there are other problems that we're working on that are hard to solve in the JavaScript ecosystem and virtualizing in JavaScript, and therefore we are making great progress in convincing the browsers to provide that security for us to become built in so it would all, both be performant and secured. And once we do that, I think it's going to unlock, unlock a lot of things. Unfortunately, that wasn't what I was talking about today. But if you're interested in that, make sure to check out the Snow project. Um, so Snow kind of defends like a different aspect of problems that are identified within the web security industry. But as when it comes to Lava Dome, there is some effort we're trying to do. There's one specific issue that makes it really hard to create this project. And we're talking to Firefox to maybe try to solve it, specifically happening on Firefox. Um, but once we actually manage to convince people that this is important, it would be easier to try to convince browsers to adopt it. Uh, great job, Gal. Uh, I have a question. Can you clarify the real life uh, use case you presented? So you wanna isolate parts of the DOM is that within the extension scope, like from, from the, the supply chain, like other scripts that you are using inside the extension? Yes, let me clarify. So what we're worried about is how the extension eventually is a web application, right? It's a JavaScript, HTML, CSS application with just slightly more permissions over the web page. So it means that our MetaMask application is just a web application and when we create it and build it, we have a complex supply chain that constructs the MetaMask application. So for many reasons, we don't trust the code that we ship into MetaMask because of the fact that we can't really trust the supply chain. So one thing that we're worried about is if someone manages to breach the supply chain of ours, they're going to be trying to wait for the private key to be introduced into the DOM and then steal it when it happens and leak it to a malicious server. That is exactly what we're worried about and that is exactly what Lava Dome is trying to solve. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, partially. I have a, a follow-up question. So if, uh, if uh, you are trying to prevent your supply chain from accessing the key, and since they are inside the extension, they share the same... Uh, levels of, of privilege uh, that you have inside the extension. So what things do you do? Uh, because like if one of those runs first, they could booby trap, you know, like uh, some APIs uh, in a way that what you do next uh, is not efficient. So the question is, what do you do 
or to prevent that from happening inside right. the extension scope? So allow me to clarify. Um, as far as I'm aware from researching security aspects for the web, one problem that no one has managed to solve so far, and I don't think it's going to be solvable because it's by design when it comes to the web, is that JavaScript code running before other JavaScript code is by definition going to have power over it. That means that Lavadome part, like part of the threat model for Lavadome, and that is mentioned in the readme if you like go through the entire thing, you're going to find out that there are a couple of things that Lavadome doesn't protect you against. And that is like one of it is definitely JavaScript code running before Lavadome. There's nothing you can do in the JavaScript ecosystem um, as of today, the way the web is designed, to prevent code running before you from harming and undermining your mission. So Lavadome is really good at protecting um, the DOM from code that is being introduced to the application after Lavadome is introduced. But if there's code that, if someone managed to breach MetaMask supply chain and run code before MetaMask um, initiates the Lavadome instance, then we're screwed. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? No? So one more round of applause to Gal.